Good morning, everybody. Um, well, at least it's morning for me. Um, th- this um, is the first of three uh, linked podcasts, the first of a series of three, um, the purpose of which is to take you through the political ideas um, that underpinned German history um, from 1871 onwards. Um, so the, this first podcast will focus on left-wing ideas, the second one um, will focus on right-wing ideas, and the third one will focus on the sort of centre or liberal ideas. Um, what you're looking at here is you're looking at the handout that you've got. It's probably useful for you to have the handout in front of you. Um, and as you play the podcast um, at any point, if you want to just pause the podcast and uh, read through uh, the handout just to sort of consolidate your understanding. Start off with this. Okay, now that's a, bit, a, a, a diagram of the uh, what, what I call the social pyramid uh, that we've already looked at in class. Um, it represents uh, society as a as a pyramid um, in which the larger group, um, the, uh, the the sort of labouring classes, are at the bottom, and the um, smaller group are at the top. Um, the um, middle and upper classes okay so broadly speaking you've got I'll just just right at the, the bottom there the sort of lc the lower classes and then the middle classes and then at the top the upper classes um, now remember um, in with germany you've got the old upper classes the landed nobility and you've got the new upper classes um, the so-called industrial elites um, but broadly speaking, the middle classes are the white collar workers and the middle stand, and then the lower classes. Remember, um, you've got the urban workers, which are the growing, expanding lower classes, and the rural workers, the peasants, um, are in relative decline, as there is a land fluke, to mo- a flight from the land movement from the countryside to the cities. Okay, so that's just a representation of what society looks like, and it could apply to pretty much to. Um, every single um, country or developing industrialising country at this time. Um, also on the diagram, and we'll develop this more in the in the, the podcasts as we go through, um, are the different political parties um, that would represent those groups um, in Parliament. Okay, so you've got the Conservative Party for the upper classes and the National Liberals for the um, new elites, and then you've got the Left Liberals um, for the, mid- the middle classes, and you've got um, two parties, um, or effectively the, the only one really we need to talk about, are the Social Democrats who represent the growing urban elites. Now the other thing obviously to remember about the um, Social Pyramid is that the power, of, power at the top lies with the few. Um, the many at the bottom have relatively little power. I think in terms of power as both political power, which is having a say in the running of the country, and an economic power which is controlling the wealth of the country. So let's move on. Now, if you imagine the power, the um, p- p- social pyramid I just looked at at the bottom here, um, I've just turned it on its side. Okay, so effectively you've still got this pyramid. You've got the large group on the left, the urban working classes, the middle classes, and the upper classes, the smaller group on the right. What this diagram shows is what we call the political spectrum. Um, it is the range of political views, and it still very much applies to the world today, um, as it does to the world of the 1870s, 1880s, um, when we began this course. Um, so you've got, broadly speaking, um, you've got the left-wing groups, okay, if I draw a line down there, um, on one side, You've got uh, the left-wing groups, which we call socialism, okay? And on the other side, we've got the right-wing groups, okay, that um, can be called different things. We'll develop that in the next podcast, Uh, nationalism, conservatism. Um, So broadly speaking, you can split split political ideas down the middle into left-wing and right-wing. Now, we're focusing today on the left-wing groups, okay? Now... Again, back at the bottom to our um, our social pyramid. Um, so clearly, um, left wing ideas um, are 
um, supported on the whole by the lower classes, by the urban working classes. Okay, now what does that basically mean? Well, if you think of our social pyramid, effectively you have got tension within it. Okay, so uh, as we said, the the power, both political and economic, lies with the the smaller group. Um, which effectively means, from the viewpoint of the urban working classes, it is an unfair social pyramid. Um, they, they, the larger group um, do not have access to the majority of the wealth and power of the country. Um, and so a key word is, is that the lower classes would feel exploited by the middle and the upper classes. Okay, Now, the upper classes are so relatively small in terms of um, the importance in, in history at this stage. Um, on the whole, I'll be talking about the middle classes. And then from the, from the viewpoint of an urban working class person, um, you, you wouldn't really see the upper classes as so much, but you would directly see the, the middle classes on a day-to-day -day basis. The middle classes would be the people who run the factories that you work in, for example. And so a common word that was used by the urban working classes was they were being exploited Okay, exploited by the middle classes, uh, and increasingly they talk. They call the middle classes the capitalist class. Okay, which was a term used by Karl Marx, who theorized. He wrote down the sort of view that eventually the urban working classes would have had enough. Um, they would have developed revolutionary consciousness, as he called it, and they would rise up and overthrow the middle classes, um, and. And when that happens, build up a socialist society. So that word socialist or left wing, what does it basically mean? It basically means an ideal in which wealth and power is redistributed um, um, amongst the urban working classes. It's taken from the middle classes and upper classes and it is redistributed and given to the urban working classes. Okay. Now... One of the key things that you need to understand here, of course, is that we've, we've said that there is socialism, which is between that arrow and that one there. Um, but as you can see, socialism was divided. The, the, uh, d the dashed line um, that we have there shows that there were extreme socialists, who we call communists. Um, they were such strong believers of the ideas of Karl Marx, that they believed any means was justified to bring about a socialist society, including revolution, which basically means a violent overthrow, so a sudden violent overthrow of the middle classes. Whereas the moderate left-wing socialists um, did not believe in the extreme violence of the communists, and the moderate socialists um, believed that change should be brought about peacefully um, through democratic process. In other words, by um, pushing for change in elected assemblies, in other words, parliaments, or in Germany, the Reichstag. Um, and that may take, it may take years, it may take decades um, to bring about a socialist society, but it should be done through discussion and agreement by talking to the middle classes and persuading them to bring about change, rather than um, a, a rather than a, a violent overthrow of the system. Now, broadly speaking, um, in German history, the SPD, the Social Democratic Party (SPD), um, sat in the moderate left wing camp. Okay, that's where they sat. Um, there was only one SPD. There was only one political party for the left. Um, in the 1870s, it was the SPD. But what we will see as we go through the course is that increasingly um, some members of the SPD became disillusioned with that approach and increasingly um, you start to see members of the SPD break away um, and form more extreme left-wing groups. Now, those extreme left-wing groups um, gravitated towards communist ideas um, but they did not actually call themselves the communists until 1919. Um, before 1919, um, they um, had different names which will develop as we go through the course. Let's move on then to the next one. As I say, well, I won't talk about the extreme right wing because that's the next, the next podcast. 
Okay, so um, here's another way of representing the idea of socialism. Okay, um, you can see here uh, we've got the same um, social pyramid model. Okay, and it is the same for the two countries. You've got country A and country B, and exactly the same. You've got the um, social pyramid, and of course the gap between the middle classes and the working classes in both countries represents that tension, that feeling, there's that word, that the, the majority are being exploited by the minority, that the upper class, the, the, um, the working classes are being exploited by the middle classes. There is a tension represented by that gap in the pyramid. So basically the point is here that the working classes, the, the lower classes, of country A and the lower classes of country B um, have got a, a mutual feeling. They, they have a shared feeling. They have a, something that they share, which is they, they dislike the middle classes of their own country who are exploiting them. The problem, of course, though, is, is that with different countries, there is a national boundary okay, that separates the people of the two countries. And that national boundary prevents them communicating with each other. Um, the lower classes of those two countries would want to work together against the middle classes of their countries. But it's difficult for them to work together because of national boundaries. National boundaries may be represented by language, for example. It makes it difficult um, for them uh, to work together. Um, so that's the sort of idea that's represented there. Okay. Now, extreme socialists, okay, which would eventually be called the communists, believe that the following should happen. Okay? They believe that um, that tension um, that exists between the working classes and the middle classes in both of those example countries would eventually result in a violent overthrow of the middle classes in both countries. So effectively, as you can see in the lower diagram, the um, middle classes have been removed from the equation. That's a revolution. And once that happens, then the way is open for the lower classes of both countries to work together, to pull together, to unite. Um, so, um, because... Let's say the, the, the first violent overthrow happens in country A. Well, then the workers in country B will be inspired to do the same, to follow the example of, of, the, work, of the workers in country A. Um, and so, effectively, there has been like a domino effect. One working class revolution has led to another, and the workers of the world are uniting together against the middle classes of the world. So, according to Karl Marx's theory, once you have this process happening, and it may start in one country, and then it will have a domino effect and go to the next country, and then to country C and country D, etc., um, national boundaries will start to dissolve, and the working classes of the different countries of the world will start to unite together. And that's why one of the catchphrases of communism, of extreme socialism, is working classes of the world unite. So in other words, socialism is internationalist. Now if you think back to our original political spectrum, on the left wing we call it socialists, on the right wing we call it nationalists. Socialism is internationalists. It is the opposite because they believe that boundaries between nations should break down. So the resulting society that then exists, an international society, will be classless. It will be government by the working classes for the working classes in which middle classes no longer exist because the wealth of the world is shared equally amongst all classes. That's extreme socialists. Now moderate socialists believe in that 
that outcome. They believe that national boundaries should be broken down. Moderate socialists are internationalist as well. They believe that workers of the world should unite and work together. But they believe that process should happen not through violence, but through peaceful parliamentary means. So just to summarise, go through the list. Okay, so number one, um, socialists, whether you are left or right, tend to believe in the sharing of wealth and therefore support the poorer industrial working classes of the world. Socialists, whether you are left, whether you are extreme or middle, okay, so wherever you lie on that spectrum there, socialists tend to follow the ideas of Karl Marx. Karl Marx was a German philosopher. He theorised, okay, he wrote, wrote books about what he believed would eventually happen in industrial societies. Followers of Karl Marx are called Marxists, and they believe that the industrial working class will eventually develop, keyword, try to use them in your answers, revolutionary consciousness. What does that mean? It means a hatred of the middle classes who are exploiting them. Now, Marx called them different things. He called them capitalists. He also called them bourgeoisie. Okay? Um, it, this will lead to the overthrow of the middle classes and the creation of a classless society. Marx believed that once this happened in one country, a domino effect. Don't use that word domino effect, though, in your answer. Okay? I'm using that to illustrate a purpose. But that term, domino effect, was later used um, in the 20th century. Um, so actually using it to describe 19th century processes um, would be an anachronism. So although it, 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 it illustrates the purpose, don't use that term. Okay? Um, but effectively, like a domino effect, it would result in which the working classes of other countries would follow the examples of their brothers, as they called them, i.e. workers of the world would unite against the middle classes and there would be a worldwide socialist revolution. Socialists tend to believe that people's loyalty should not be to their country, therefore, but to the workers of the world. In other words, they are internationalist, not nationalists. Nationalists on the right wing, um, the opposite side of the spectrum, believe that the loyalty of any one person, whether you are rich or poor, should be first and foremost to your country. Okay? Whereas socialists are internationalists. They believe your loyalty should be to the workers of the world, against the rich of the world. Moderate socialists tend to believe that a classless society should be brought about peacefully, by elected political parties working through Parliament, and that wealth does not need to be entirely evenly distributed. An element of capitalism can be retained. So the further you go to the extreme left, the greater the redistribution of wealth. If you're on the moderate left, there, you do believe that you, there should be some redistribution of wealth, but not, not complete redistribution of wealth. Extreme socialists, though, believe in a completely classless society in which the middle classes and the upper classes have been eliminated and that a classless society can be brought about through a violent revolution rather than through parliamentary peaceful process. Okay, so that's just a brief um, summary of what left-wing ideas mean. The next podcast will look at the right side of the political spectrum. Thank you.